uh, pinagpupunyagian po na Senador Gatsalian. Salamat po sa pagsama niyo po at uh, pakikinig at harinawa po sa dulo po ng uh, uh, umagang ito ay matimbang po ninyo yung panig ng mga civil society na nagsasabing panataliing, matatag at pagtibayin ng mga katalukuyang batas rather than sundang muli ang isa pang panibagong batas na magbubukas sa waste to energy option. Ang una pong tagapagsalita ay ang aming pong kinatawan buhat sa uh, Break Free from Plastic Coalition si Bon. Uh, bon, can you uh, take your seat? Uh, ganun din po, natutuwa po ako makasama again uh, si Dr. Jorge Manuel uh, taga Siliman University po siya at mag matagal na rin po namin siyang uh, kasakasama maging sa healthcare without some ng mga proyekto on uh, medical waste uh, some uh, years ago. Um, Jorge, pakiusog mo na lang yung bag ko nakabala yata dyan. And then, uh, andi, uh, dumating na po ba si Concejal Lagman? At uh, tawagin na rin po natin siya sa harapan uh, para po makasama sa mga uh, panelists natin. At uh, siya po ay Concejal Buwata San Fernando City at isa pong hindi lamang po advocate kundi practitioner ng uh, zero waste uh, management mismo ko. Tataguyod naman ng Green Hospital, kabilang po siya sa leader namin sa Healthcare Without Harm, si Sister Arce. Uh, Sir Nilio, kung pwede pong umupo na rin po kayo, Sister. At uh, magbuhat po dito, uh, iikot po itong mikropono. Uh, pagkatapos po, kung pwede pong pakinote ang inyong mga tanong, unless there will be a very pressing question that I can entertain pertinent to a particular input or resource speaker, then I may uh, call on you. But otherwise, I would rather na magsalita po ng uh, sa takdang oras yung ating mga uh, panelists at, and experts and then we will have an open forum uh, later on. So, uh, let's start uh, with uh, uh, sa aming pong kasama, si Bon Hernandez. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mon. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Senator Ketsalian. Thanks for uh, joining this forum. Uh, and I thank uh, the Office of Senator Villar and uh, our colleagues in Noburn, Pilipinas uh, for organizing this timely uh, event. Now, I was asked to help frame uh, this morning's uh, forum uh, and also to provide a bit of uh, background and context to, uh, let's say, the debates around waste to energy, uh, incineration, and uh, zero waste. Uh, I come from a perspective where uh, actually I was then a uh, chief of uh, or head of the legislative division of uh, the Office of Central Mercado, who was one of the original authors of the Clean Air Act. And I was the staffer assigned to draft uh, the version. Uh, and many of those provisions that you find in the law today have survived, actually, uh, that process. Uh, and, and so I offered that perspective based on my experience. Uh, since then, I have moved to uh, uh, civil society. I, uh, I'm currently the global coordinator of the Break Free from Plastic Movement, which is a global uh, movement uh, of NGOs, individuals, uh, who are supporting a future free from plastic pollution. Um, I've been in the environmental movement for more than 25 years. Uh, Hoping, hoping that that does not betray my age. <laughs> but uh, okay, uh, to the topic at hand. Uh, the Clean Air Act, Republic Act 8749, considered one of the landmark pieces of environmental legislation uh, together with RA 9003 or the Ecological Solid Waste Management Act. Um, ever since, uh, uh, and this, is, uh, this could be you know, proven evidenced by the record, the legislative record, the debates that have attended the passage of this law, even uh, at the bicameral conference, uh, which I was also, uh, where I was also present in uh, at that time. The spirit and intent of the Cleaner Act is really essentially to protect and advance 
uh, the rights of Filipinos to a balanced and helpful ecology. That is a constitutional provision. And it recognizes, first and foremost, the rights of Filipinos to clean air. Yun talaga yung ano niya eh, na i-protectahan yung, yung, yung health at environment ng mga Filipino. In fact, uh, in the declaration of policy, you'll find uh, very, uh, 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 forward-looking uh, provisions, in particular, uh, the Declaration of Policy says that the focus of the Clean Air Act is primarily on pollution prevention rather than pollution control. That's very important. And in fact, this pollution prevention intent of the Clean Air Act is uh, manifested in two key provisions. Uh, number one is the prohibition on the manufacture, import, and sale of unleaded gasoline. So as you know, we now have unleaded gasoline. But that was a clearly pollution preventive act. And the second is the ban on incinerators. Now, uh, the ban, uh, these uh, two provisions actually uh, constitute what we would say to be the real uh, uh, so we to use in a celebrate the mga environmental activists, not only in the Philippines, but also uh, globally you know, as really a model uh, uh, provisions uh, in the Clean Air Act. They are also pollution uh, prevention uh, oriented in as much as they advance uh, the use of alternatives. In the case of uh, uh, of course, the provision in the Clean Air Act really states that uh, uh, the alternative to uh, incinerator is the implementation of ecological waste management, which includes waste segregation, uh, recycling, and composting. In fact, it foreshadowed uh, the, uh, uh, the enactment of uh, the Public Act 9003, the Clean Air Act was approved in 1999, that was 2001, yung 9003. And the twin measure sila, and the ban on incineration is also, again, reinforced in the Public Act 9003. Secondly, also in the same provision, uh, uh, the ban on incinerators also recommends uh, the use or application of what we call non-burn technologies. So, malino yun eh, na sinasabi sa, 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 sa batas. Kasi nga, ang intent noon is really uh, we need to prevent pollution. And one of the recognition by legislators then, uh, when they enacted the law, was that uh, the state, at that time, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, cannot really guarantee uh, that uh, Filipinos could be uh, uh, protected from emissions of concern coming from or arising from facilities uh, such as incinerators. The power to permit or the power to issue permits must be matched with the power to protect the public and the Department of Environment and Natural Resources could not guarantee uh, at that time that they could do so. And we maintain up to now that the uh, DNR uh, uh, will still be challenged uh, to safeguard this right uh, if uh, you know incinerators and their modern variants were to be allowed to operate. Now, uh, we maintain also uh, on the part of Northern Filipinas uh, that there's no such thing as a toxic free incinerator. Uh, all the variants that are mentioned, pyrolysis, gasification, waste to energy being the latest one. Uh, these are all variations of uh, burn or thermal uh, uh, technologies and uh, we maintain and we firmly believe that there is no such thing as a toxic free incinerator. Uh, incineration converts three tons of waste into uh, one ton of ash, toxic ash, uh, which is considered hazardous waste in many countries including in the United States and requires special treatment and handling and not to mention the fugitive emissions uh, coming from smokestacks uh, and, and the fly ash. Um, and at the same time, uh, we hope Dr. Emmanuel can enlighten uh, the group about the fact that uh, for many of these emissions of concern, uh, we are particularly concerned with the dioxins and furans, some of the most toxic substances known to science uh, and with no known safety threshold levels. So, yung sinasabi natin na may safe levels to ay uh, una-una ay uh, napatunayan na, na hindi uh, at walang level or safe level of exposure when it comes to dioxins and furans. And we are concerned, of course, because we know that studies have shown that four kilometers around incinerators, uh, the radius, you know, when you look at that, the, uh, the 
rates of cancer are higher compared to places with no uh, incinerators. Uh, this was uh, uh, one of the reports that we were citing at that time when we were pushing for the ban on incineration. And uh, when you talk of dioxins and furans, it's not just cancer, you're also talking about reproductive deficits, learning disabilities, uh, endocrine disruption, a host of uh, uh, potential impacts, which is also the reason why in the Cleaner Act itself there is a provision that says that uh, the Philippines or the government should come up with an action plan uh, in keeping with uh, the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants to reduce and eliminate these dioxins and furans. Uh, the Philippines is a signatory to the Stockholm Convention uh, whose aim is to ultimately eliminate uh, the sources of uh, dioxins and furans and waste incineration, also known as waste of energy, is uh, among uh, those chief sources of uh, this uh, uh, emissions of concern. Which brings us to this forum today. Uh, and the reason why we uh, uh, wanted to organize this forum with the Office of uh, uh, Central Villar is so we can share our views, first of all, around uh, waste to energy, what are the pitfalls of waste to energy, and second also so we can demonstrate the viability of the alternative. And this, al uh, this uh, is now being seen implementation in many places, in San Fernando in particular, uh, where you have a, uh, that uh, totally uh, removes or eliminates the use of uh, uh, an incinerator facility, for example. And that is the model that we should aspire for. It's a model that, is, that has been envisioned uh, by the law both the Cleaner Act and the Republic Act 9003. We hope that those will be supported instead of, you know, new attempts to undermine what essentially has been uh, already recognized as the real and sustainable solution to our waste problem. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bon. And now let's move to, uh, to Dr. Jorge Emanuel from Philippine University. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator, for joining us and uh, the uh, congressional staff and aides and other guests. Um, today, I, I'll talk about uh, specifically on waste to energy. Um, and even as I, I was sitting here, I'm making a mental note of addressing certain issues. But so I, I might digress a little bit from what I have. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So first of all, I'd like to make a distinction. Uh, for this forum, whenever I say waste to energy, I'm referring to thermal waste to energy because there's yet another form of waste to energy which I refer to as biological waste to energy. Biological waste to energy are those technologies that mimic, enhance the natural biological process. A good example are biodigesters. There are some new fermentation technologies today. There's the mechanical, biological, aerobic design technologies, all of which have been used, uh, used for decades. So I won't be talking about those. I will be talking instead about the thermal uh, waste to energy, which in the examples I give include the old traditional designs of incinerators with, um, with heat recovery, as well as the newer forms of uh, incineration. And I, I will talk a bit about this terminology in a second. It's one of the things I want to add. Next slide, please. Um, so first, um, uh, let me say uh, pyrolysis, that term, uh, is used uh, by scientists and engineers like myself to refer specifically to a process that takes place where in uh, a solid, say in this case, or a waste material, is thermally decomposed. When we say thermal, we mean heat through the action of heat with, without the addition of air or oxygen. I emphasize the term without the addition because many people, uh, especially those trying to sell these technologies, will tell you pyrolysis uh, is done uh, in the absence of oxygen or air. But of course, uh, uh, saying that it's done in the absence of oxygen is scientifically impossible because uh, typically there is oxygen 
uh, embedded in the chemical structure of the waste material to begin with. Uh, and often on a real world application, waste as it comes into a, say a primary chamber, will come in with pockets of air all throughout, even if you try to use a vacuum before you do the, he the heating. So there's always air, uh, there's always oxygen. There's a reason for this because you need oxygen to produce dioxins and furans. And that's the reason some of them try to mislead you by telling you there's no oxygen, therefore there's no dioxin and furan. That's uh, scientifically impossible. Um, now, when we talk about pyrolysis, they can be in a, a lower heat range, say between 400 to 800 degrees C, or they can be much higher from 1,000 to 8,000 degrees centigrade. That's pyrolysis. Next. Gasification, on the other hand, and some people sometimes use this a little bit interchangeably, but uh, among science, uh, scientists and engineers, we prefer to consider gasification uh, where, uh, as the process wherein limited amounts of oxygen are, are allowed, added, more than you'd have in pyrolysis. Uh, and so this also is often done in both a lower range and in a much higher range. Um, and uh, the idea, actually, for both of them is that you're actually trying to produce a gas, and that gas, if you're using, for example, small, small amounts of air, we refer to, th to that as a producer gas. If you use small amounts of oxygen that you add, we refer to that as syngas. Uh, the difference between the two is the, the, uh, uh, the heat content of the gas, which is typically between about 25 to, say, 40 percent of the heat content of natural gas. So um, next slide, please. Uh, Ruel. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I use this as an energy spectrum to try to explain these scientific terms. Um, and here I'm trying to show that um, uh, this is in the order of the amount of oxygen that exists in, in the system. So if you have no added air or oxygen, and you just use basically the oxygen that came in with the waste, uh, people typically call that uh, pyrolysis. If you allow limited amounts of air oxygen, that's often gasification. And then if you have even uh, a bit more oxygen, uh, that is typically what would be considered the substoichiometric uh, chamber, the primary chamber of the traditional starved air incinerator. Uh, if you add even more oxygen, then you have a typical secondary chamber, and then if you add a lot of uh, air or oxygen, then that's what we used to refer to as the excess air incinerators, which nobody likes to use because uh, they're the most polluting for multiple reasons. A few things I'll also mention is that in terms of the chemistry, I'm sorry I'm giving you a bit, I, I, I'm both a chemist and an engineer, so I'll give you a little bit of the chemistry of it. So uh, uh, the, these parts, in this spectrum are referred to as endothermic, which means the reactions that take place require the addition of heat. Whereas those on this end are exothermic, meaning once you start the process, the process can then go on on its own and it actually produces its own heat to continue. So for if you're working with uh, uh, pyrolysis or gasification, you have to constantly put in heat. And the reason this is important is because many times uh, the people who produce equipment more on this side of the spectrum will say we produce a lot of energy, but you have to be careful because what you're really interested in is what is the net energy because to run this equipment you need to put in a lot of energy to keep the endothermic reaction going. Now, let me talk about this obfuscation of terms. And the reason for this is because uh, in the Philippines and also in other countries, I noticed that people would sell equipment. I remember, and maybe Vaughn might even remember this from years back, where I was asked to evaluate this newfangled, ad I forget the term they use, advanced oxidation technology system. And so I said, okay, I'll go take a look at it. Um, so I started work on this generation back in the late 1980s. It was my first major area of expertise. So I said, okay, I'll take a look at it. And as soon as I got there, I said, well, this is a standard dual chamber incinerator, but they give it a different name. In fact, 
since back in the 80s, I used to track all the incinerary companies around the world. Uh, this was a technology that was supposedly brought in from Canada. So I pulled out their old, fortunately I printed their old website, and I compared it to the new website, and it was virtually identical except everywhere where it used to say incinerator, they now called it the advanced oxidation technology or something like that. Um, and there have been many games like this that have been played. So let me, uh, can I use this one for a second? Let me do a little explanation. Um, so incineration could be defined as the burning, in this case say incineration waste, the burning of waste material, um, which then produces uh, toxic and noxious gases. It's very close to the definition of the Clean Air Act. But let me explain what typically happens, except for rare cases, of a solid that is burnt. Um, as a f I'll give you background on the physics of combustion. If this is a solid material, and in science we refer to most of these solids as uh, pyrolyzing solids because, uh, let us say you're going to start the burning process, you have to produce an initial amount of heat. This could be a spark, this could be fire from natural gas, a match, whatever you want to use. Uh, also, the more newer fangled systems use induction heat, they use plasma, whatever might be source of energy. The whole purpose is you want to begin to heat this material. And what happens is that the first thing that happens is actually a pyrolysis reaction. What happens is as this material is being heated, uh, volatile materials from this waste begin to evolve out of the solid phase and they slowly come out of the solid and then they go into the gas phase. Now, in uh, fire science, there's something we call the standoff flame distance. That's the distance between the surface to where the actual flame is. So if you actually look at some pictures of burning logs and so on, you'll notice that the flame often is not right at the surface. It's a little bit above it. That's because there's a place where the gas has to evolve, this volatile gas, and then finally it reaches a point where there's enough oxygen or air, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, an exothermic reaction takes place, and so the fire, f the fire fr front, uh, the flame front begins. Um, and so, what actually happens in any burning is you begin with a pyrolysis reaction, uh, and then slowly it becomes sort of a gasification reaction because then you had more and more oxygen till the point that you have enough oxygen, where it becomes exothermic, and it causes the flame. So that's burning, that's incineration. Now what if you were to do a newfangled system where you actually separated it so that this part becomes, say, your first chamber, and this part becomes another portion of your equipment. By the way, the pyrolysis reaction that takes place in, in the traditional incinerator and standard burning takes place between 10 seconds to several minutes. So if instead you separated this and made it part of another system, and if your source of energy instead of uh, fire or natural gas flame is now plasma or induction heat or some other fancy thing, then the, the tendency then is for people to say, ah, this is no longer burning of waste, this is now some newfangled waste to energy thing. We'll call it pyrolysis, we'll call it plasma, we'll call it gasification. But for me as a scientist, realizing how regular burning takes place and the engineering that was done to separate this, this whole system, as far as I'm concerned, is still an incinerator. And that's the reason why in the European Union, these plasma technologies and other waste to energies are all under EU law considered incinerators. It's the reason why when I was in the, in the advisory committee of the US EPA on pyrolysis and gasification, we regulated all this as if they were incinerators. And because, because uh, not only is the process all part of the same similar process, but because the pollutants coming out are the same types of pollutants of concern to us. Perhaps at different levels, but they're all, they're all the same things. Uh, so whether it's, whether it's pyrolysis, uh, plasma pyrolysis, or a standard old traditional incinerator with heat recovery, we're still concerned with particulate matter we're still concerned with dioxins, we're still concerned with SOX, with NOx, with heavy metals, and so on. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, between 1990 or something to the early 200s, uh, 2000s, 
Uh, I was the uh, chief um, technical consultant for a group in the U.S. called the HCI. And the HCI was actually a collaborative of different groups, and it was primarily the electric utilities who were all interested in waste to energy at the time to produce electricity. And so I evaluated dozens of these waste to energy technologies from around the world, many from the U.S., from Japan, from Sweden, and so on. By the way, at that time, uh, when I left the program, by the time I left the program, not a single one of those technologies actually continues to this day. They've all failed. So these are examples of, say, pyrolysis technologies. I mentioned you can have pyrolysis that actually uses syngas as a source of energy or regular fossil fuel oil or resistance heating or induction heating or plasma. These are all different types. Next. Um, uh, these, these are examples of plasma pyrolysis systems. I still remember many of these. None of these exist today. There are basically two types, transferred and non-transferred plasmas. None of them work. These go to extremely high temperatures. That's one of the problems, by the way, many of them didn't work because they're operating at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 degrees C. Um, I remember which is that system, say, at the top, for example. Uh, they use plasma torches, and what happens is you have to use special refractories to uh, meet that intense heat. And because waste is so heterogeneous as it comes in, there are all these fluctuations in temperature and the thermal stresses on the, on the, uh, the refractors were always constantly failing. And they might last a year, they have to be changed, eventually they fail. Next. Um, so I want to point out that people will say, ah, but these pyrolysis systems don't produce any emissions. Some will even say no emissions. That's, of course, impossible scientifically. So here I mentioned, for example, some of the types of pollutants you get from just pyrolysis at the lower temperatures, and the one at the bottom is at the higher temperatures. And you can see one thing that's common to all of them is polychlorinated dioxins and furans, the term we've been using to mean, when we use the term dioxins, we mean, we actually mean polychlorinated dibenzodioxins and dibenzofurans, but the whole range of other pollutants that come out next. Uh, and these are examples of gasification technologies. Uh, I included here one gasification technology that did not exist at the time I was doing my studies, and that's the one at the top right, and that's the one that's recently been sold to Puerto Princesa, Palawan. This is the, um, the altar, um, the, the, it's basically the Westinghouse plasma torch system. But there are many of these technologies, and as far as I'm concerned, in principle, they're all incinerators. Um, so, and these are examples, and this is from the US EPA from uh, tons of data where they give you examples of the types of uh, pollutants and how much uh, you, you are able to get on average from say 100 tons per day of either an incinerator, a traditional old incinerator, or the newer gasification systems, but uh, as you can see, they're still all very polluting. Next. Um, and I, I will also mention uh, something that you should be aware of. Uh, I did mention earlier that they all produce dioxins, but there are changes in levels. So let me tell you uh, one uh, difference between uh, the emissions of a, a traditional old incinerator and, say, a pyrolysis uh, technology. Uh, one difference we found is that in the pyrolysis system, uh, you produce more of the furans than you do of the dioxins. Um, and this is important because there are 120 dioxins and furans. When we say dioxins, we actually mean both dioxins and furans. It's because it's such a long uh, name. But uh, you should also know that these 120 dioxins, which are among the most toxic substances known in science, uh, that these compounds have different levels of toxicity. Uh, 20 of them are extremely toxic. And so when we measure, um, when we're trying to understand, okay, what's coming out of this incinerator or this new waste to energy plant? So we measure what comes out, but uh, instead of measuring uh, 120 different chemicals, we typically uh, measure at least the top 20 most toxic ones. And because they're at different levels of toxicity, for example, 2378 polychlorinated dibenzodioxin is the most toxic, so it's given a weighing scale of one. 
the next one might be given a weighing scale of 0.5 and so on. Uh, and so what you do is you measure each of those concentrations, multiply it by its toxicity equivalent factor, that factor that reflects that one is more toxic than the other, and then you add those all together. So it's actually a toxicity weighted concentration of these dioxins that we get. And the reason I point this out is because sometimes you might get some people who will say, ah, our pyrolysis system is so good, we produce very little of dioxins. These are the 10 of the dioxin compounds. But uh, what they won't tell you is they produce more of the furans. But the important thing is when you add their toxicity equivalent factors, that's what makes what's important for us. That's why the, the units we uh, use to put a limit on dioxins is how many nanograms toxic equivalent of dioxins per, say, uh, cubic meter or standard or normal cubic meter. So an example, for example, uh, such as this, uh, studies have shown that in some of these uh, pyrolysis equipment, they do produce more furans than dioxins, but then when you add up the toxicity, the total toxicity uh, of all ends up being higher than you might, say, get from uh, uh, another type of uh, uh, standard incinerator. So ke keep that in mind that we're uh, talking about a combination of two different uh, groups of chemicals of different toxicities, and it's the total toxicity that's of importance to us. Next slide. So let me now talk about some environmental and health impacts. Um, so the, the Clean Air Act says uh, incineration, the burning of municipal biomedical hazardous waste, which pr uh, process emits poisonous and, and toxic fumes, is hereby uh, prohibited. So incinerators and the newer versions of waste to energy plants all produce the most poisonous and toxic substances known to humans. That's to me the irony. Uh, next slide. Uh, actually, maybe I, I made a mental note to, to say something else at this point. Because I'm about to focus a lot on dioxins and furans. But keep in mind that all of these technologies, whether it's the old traditional ones or the newfangled waste to energy, plasma, or gasification technologies, they also produce particulate matter, as I said. They also produce heavy metals. They also produce the, ra the typical range of all these pollutants. I want to say a few things about particulate matter. Uh, because the story that I'll be telling you about dioxin is the same story that we, I, I have to tell you about particulate matter, although I didn't prepare any slides for it. Often, our laws have not kept up with the science. Because now we know, in the past, we would measure particulate matter as particulate matter of 10 microns. In other words, it's what science at the time was able to measure from the stack or measure from the air. You use this specialized collectors. And at that time, they could only measure uh, up to 10 microns. They couldn't uh, capture the small very fine particles. And yet in science today, we know that the deadliest particulate matters are the ones that are on the range of one micron or less. I understand DNR EMB uh, in the last few years has finally been able to do measurements now of 2.5 microns and maybe even uh, uh, one micron. But the deadliest are one micron, 0.5 micron, all the way to the nanoparticles because we now know that these particles, unlike say, um, the bigger particles are caught by the cilia in your nose. Uh, but what we now know is the very fine particles that we have a hard time measuring can go through your nose, past the cilia, past your alveoli, all the way to, uh, to, the, uh, to the membrane because it goes directly into the blood. That's the reason why in the U.S. there's been a lot of concern of the very fine particles of diesel because we have now, uh, it's now been shown in studies that these actually causes cancer, all sorts of other health problems, and it's the fine particles that we're very concerned of. Unfortunately, uh, many laws around the world and laws in the Philippines have not caught up to it be because uh, uh, it's very di it takes a lot more equipment to measure them at finer uh, levels. Uh, so now let me focus uh, on dioxins. Next slide. So this is the most deadly of the dioxin, 2378. 
TCDD, as a short name. Next slide, please. Um, so let me tell you one of the properties of these dioxins. Uh, the reason they're concerned, uh, considered the most toxic, uh, among the most toxic substances known to humans is because they produce toxic effects at extremely low concentrations. Um, so when I was in the um, uh, member of the expert group uh, that put together the guidelines for the Stockholm Convention, we were very concerned about this because we realized, because we were, uh, we were uh, tasked actually to figure out what should be the international limit for these dioxins. The irony, t uh, let me answer that question. The answer we had to that question is we had to base it on what were the capabilities of industry at that time. I, I also have a degree in public health, as some of you know, but in the field of public health, this is an area where we wring our, our pull our hair. I have, I'm losing some hair, maybe that's why. Uh, because we know from public health that even the levels that we put, that I admit having to put uh, and recommend in the bat uh, guidelines of the Stockholm Convention, we knew we're not completely uh, protective of human health. Uh, we knew that if we put extremely low concentrations that many of us wanted, there won't be, there won't be any waste of energy or any incineration in the world, and we had people from industry there that were fighting us, so we had, this was a compromise. So, but take a look at the levels at which dioxins can produce cancer, these are from animal studies, and in all of these, we're talking about nanograms and picograms. For example, uh, the, as far as I know, uh, as a public health person, as an environmental toxicologist, this is uh, the, um, the lowest cancer potency factor I know of any chemical in the world. That's why it's considered uh, the most toxic uh, compound, um, because uh, the level at which you begin to see effects of cancer per kilogram of body weight of a person is 0 0.00000000001 gram. That's an extremely small amount. Next slide. So here I'm trying to give you an idea. This is my attempt to try to make this understandable for the non-scientist. So at what level do we begin to see health effects on humans and animals? The answer to that is in the parts per trillion level, but most people have no idea what a part per trillion is. So if you take a lake, say an, a lake that's about two acres or so, one and a half to two acre lake, and you put one drop of dioxin into this lake and mix it up well, that is the level at which we begin to, we begin to see health effects in humans and animals. Uh, next level, please. Next slide, please. Um, so I talked about toxicity. There's another characteristic of dioxin you should be aware of, and that's uh, what's called bioaccumulation. Um, I'm also trained in uh, environmental science, and this is a very important concept we have in environmental science, and that's a concept of bioaccumulation, which means that bioaccumulation is the process wherein some, say, chemical substance is picked up at the lower end of the food chain and slowly goes up the food chain at increasingly higher concentrations. That, that's a way of viewing it. Technically speaking, by concentration factor is the concentration uh, of, the, of the compound in, say, a species divided by concentration of the compound, say, in water, if you're doing the by concentration factor of fish. So here I give the example of fish. If you have a fathead uh, minnow, this is a typical fish we like to use in environmental science to do these tests, and you put it in a aquarium and you put a small amount of dioxin, and you measure that amount, and then you let the fish live for 28 days, and then you uh, kill it. I can't think of a euphemism for killing the fish, but, and then you measure the amount of dioxins in its tissue. The amount, the concentration of dioxin in its tissue will be 29,200 times higher than the concentration that was in the water, which means that the fish bioconcentrated the dioxin in its uh, tissues, especially the fatty tissue. And that's the reason why in the environment, all the dioxins that we release eventually goes up the food chain and humans get most of our dioxins through meat, through fish, through eggs, and through milk. Those are the most common areas wherein we get dioxins into our bodies. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just a, 
a uh, graphic to show you this gentleman eating fish. It might be one part per trillion in that lake, but it's going to be 29,000 parts per trillion in the fish. Next slide, please. So let me tell you a third. So I talked about toxicity. I talked about bioaccumulation. Now let me tell you about the third property of dioxins. And the third property is persistence. They stay in the environment for a long time. So for example, if the dioxin from a waste to energy plant is released and it falls into the soil, on top of the soil, it's, it's half-life. Uh, again, this is a concept in environmental science. Half-life means what is the time we're in half of the concentration disappeared, but that means half of the concentration is still there. And uh, we use a rule of thumb, both in environmental science and also in medicine in terms of radioactivity, radionuclides, we use a times 10 rule of thumb, which means at what point can we more or less say that this chemical has com more or less completely dis disappeared or basically went back to background levels. And so we usually multiply it by 10, and that turns out to be a fairly good rule of thumb. So if we use the rule of thumb, if the dioxin fell into the top of the soil, it will be there for the next 90 to 150 years. If sometime, maybe shortly after it fell into the soil, maybe there was a dust storm or something, and it got covered by about, if I remember, two centimeters of soil, it's going to stay in that two centimeter of soil for the next 250 to 1,000 years. If the dioxin then falls into the, uh, from say the air into the water, uh, it will be in the body of water for about 500 years. Uh, next slide, please. Which means that if we put up a waste to energy plant today or um, any of the systems that release dioxins, whatever we had produced, released, uh, the people at the very top with the wheelchair that say us when we get old. Maybe I'm getting a little close to that now. It worries me a little bit. But anyway, if you release it and you, uh, at, during your lifetime, it's your great, 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 great grandchildren that will still be living the effects of the dioxin you had released. That is the implication of the persistence, the third frightening characteristic of these dioxins. Next slide, please. So what are the health effects of these dioxins? I mentioned that cancer is one of them. It's been known to produce cancers since way back in 1997. These are the five types of cancers where there's no more uh, debate that they produce. So they do, we, knew, we do know that they produce chron chronic lymphocytic leukemia, soft tissue sarcoma, that's the picture at the bottom, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, various types of respiratory cancer like lung, uh, laryngeal cancer and so on, and prostate cancer. There are other cancers that it's suspected to produce, uh, but these are the five where there's a very strong weight of evidence that they are uh, linked with. Next slide. Um, but it's not just cancer because uh, the sad thing about dioxins and various other chemicals, including plasticizers and plastics, is that they are endocrine disruptors, which means that when it gets into the body, the body doesn't know the difference between, they, the body thinks it's a hormone. And because uh, that, that's what an endocrine disrupting compound uh, is. Uh, and so these are the known endocrine disrupting uh, reproductive health effects of the dioxins. For males, we know that there's a reduced sperm count. There's another study maybe about five or seven years ago that showed it not, not just a reduction in the sperm count, but also uh, a reduced sperm mot motility, the, the ability of the sperm to move. Uh, it, it can result in abnormal testicles. Uh, it's been known, and this we have known first through animal studies, a reduced size of the male genital organ, especially if the, the, uh, the, the individual that's exposed to the dioxin is during the stage of the fetus or and, uh, and early childhood. Uh, and it also is associated with low t testosterone levels. For females, the reproductive effects of, ca of uh, dioxins are decreased fertility, ovarian dis dysfunction, endometriosis, and hormonal changes, uh, especially at the later age. Next slide, please. Um, there are also developmental effects of the dioxin. They cause birth defects. They alter the reproductive systems of the child, as I, of the fetus, as I mentioned, such as for the male, 
reduce size of the genital organ. Uh, they impact a child's learning ability and a child's attention, and they have been known to change the ratio of uh, male to female births. So there are more females than males in populations exposed to higher levels of dioxins. And it also suppresses the immune system. Next slide, please. Uh, so this was the dilemma we were faced with when I was in the expert group. What is the limit that we could uh, put? And there was a lot of argument, and we finally came up with a value 0.1 nanograms ITQ, remember I've explained what TQ is, per normal cubic meter measured uh, or uh, corrected at 11% oxygen. But we also added something that many people forget. We also put a limit on how much the oxygen comes out in the wastewater. Because some of these studies in the of thousands of these of us struggle, and many of them are not going to bother really moving the dioxide.
this is so if you were to actually take care of the refugee the proper way, that's a major headache for us. Okay. So uh, you should also be careful that there's a tendency, this is from your own experience, where some of the manufacturers are trying to uh, make profit, obviously, that, that they can do so. And so they often will cut costs. I'll give you the example of the one in Japan. So the one in Japan said, oh, we have this quake system that we have no. And then so I asked them, what is the quake system for? Because I think the quake system should be uh, much higher scale, much more efficient, and if you don't see the other turns out, This is the, one of the problems we need because we need to know what the rock zones are being released by this uh, by these plants. Next slide, please. Next slide. But I will tell you the new science, and I will use this as an example of, the, uh, of where our laws have not caught up with the science. This is
sending the proposition to change over time, you might have been up for very high for several hours, and then the next day might be very low. Right? And the other reason why the reaction changes is it has to do inherently with the process. Uh, the production of the reaction is a transient process, which means that in periods when the temperature goes down, you need to get out of the reaction. You know, if, if the uh, flow rate of air in the secondary chamber is up, That's all a kind of process. So what Belgium did is they said, what if we continuously monitor the reaction? And this is the result. And what you see here are periods of two weeks. Uh, yes, two week periods. And you can see here that if they only tested once a year, let's say they made their test over a year, they would say, oh, what's wrong with the reaction? Say they measured it twice a year. Maybe they measured it here. The measure it here twice a year, oh, no problem. But when they measured continuously, they found out there were, like this week, point uh, one, by the way, I forgot to put the line, point one is a little bit here. So, for example, in this week, it was like about three times higher than the limit. In this week, it was 40 times higher than the limit. In this two week period, it was like, you know, uh, here it was uh, more than 10 times the limit. What they So if you only measure uh, every quarter, and sometimes if you only measure every month, you won't sometimes catch this high episode. If we go back to the previous slide, ah, no, go back, go back, this one. So this one was a study done in the UK, because what they did is they measured it very carefully for, uh, I think, uh, three months. And what they concluded is that even if they measured the reaction uh, regularly uh, 30 times in three months, in, in other words, 10 tests in a month, they would have met this very high levels of the reaction here shown in blue that would capture my continuous the reaction testing. Uh, therefore, uh, countries like France, like Italy, now require that all these waste energy plants measured continuously for the reaction. The plant that Japan wants to bring to Java, for example, will measure it only twice a year. I think the, uh, the uh, implementing rules and regulations of the Clean Air Act says to measure it only once a year. This is an example of where our laws have not kept up with the science. And uh, I understand only sometime last year, DMD finally got the ability to do the single type of test but as far as I know today, the EMD and no, no company in the Philippines can do continuous reaction testing. But this needs to be done, and this is another good response. Thank you. So I ask them the question, if DNR does not even, or if DNR does not have the capability to do continuous testing, how can we expect, say, an LGU to really be able to monitor this complex system and to prove that, in fact, All this time, I've been talking about this magic number of 0.1 nanograms in the heat of the morning to this evening. And you remember I mentioned in my previous to this figure, I was pulling out my hair because I do have a public health person that's older than I. Well, you should know that the US EPA has reduced this figure for some of its incinerators. So for example, today, the EPA level is no longer 0.1. For some types of incinerators, it's 0.009. For others, it's 0.01. For others, it's 0.037. In other words, uh, the U.S. has started the trend of saying we need to go even lower than the 0.1. Uh, and so this is something that we need to consider. Next slide. So uh, I, I, will end with a few, I will end with a few examples uh, of the problems I've seen. These are examples of past projects. And if you are an LGU being sold, bill of goods and this waste energy, you should be aware of this. For example, uh, there was a gasification plant in the UK. Uh, it was proposed in uh, 2014. By 2016,
16, the whole project was abandoned because they realized that uh, it was the CEO of the company or even the company that they said the technology was proving a lot more difficult than people thought at the beginning because he's the CEO of the company. He withdrew his own proposal. The uh, ASCO gas station passes at the operator from 2009 to 2012, which ended up being shut down by the status
Tawagin ko na po si Sister Arce. Siya po ang administrator ng isang potensya po sa Kapila, Central Hospital in the Dr. of Kapite. At Kapila din po siya sa mga champions na kinukasili natin. At then, ang kinakasaban kong NGO, ang LK Dr. is promoting clean and healthy hospital. So, good morning. I think this is you all.
project about the five uh, showing eyes to laugh and the children for the life of them. I was uh, in the Nile Sanctuary at that time. Actually, even before that, I had heard some lectures about this kind of uh, education. I, I was a scientist in the middle of time. Uh, so I felt that somehow that interest already, I just felt it was quite possible to And this is also customized. They asked our uh, engineer, engineer process also, and they can be customized with the Amigo process. It took us some time to really um, finish the product. And so uh, our the hospital in General Santos, we have ordered it divided into space and Amigo process. And in 2018, I was transferred to Cavite. I also uh, ordered some, but absence of five years and I think that the 2014 some of the some of these legal factors have been probably uh, lost or uh, out of the order that so we could not order any more from the manufacturer of and this is not under our factors. And in fact I brought one here because I would like if somebody could help us manufacture because I know that the hospital would need these legal factors. Our own hospital itself. I will show uh, this one. So this one, this is a stainless steel legal factor. And I had the engineer made it in such a way that the needle will just be the one up to that level of the plastic. It will just be the one that will be used to be tied. And so that the, the tungsten uh, blade will not also cut to the metal so that it will not get. Uh, the, the sharpness of the, the function uh, plate, no? so it will cut to the plastic and then it will not cut. That's the amigo factor. And then we also have our autoplane sterilizer. I think this is to address infectious waste. Uh, so our uh, the diapers and some infectious waste is a very dangerous thing. They need to be de-sterilized then in our own uh, backyard before we before we send them to before we also had the, the compost bin that somebody would really like to use like this because we really had no stock of that. So we do have a stock of that. So for the phototoxic waste, these are the waste of uh, chemical drugs. So we also place them in boxes and uh, we have to be a doctor method of replacing the case. So these boxes are kept inside our work.
Center of course of central world is a sacrament of communion and a way of sharing with God and neighbor with the conviction that the divine and the human meet in a single garment of God's grace. Dr. Jorge mentioned earlier that Pope Francis said that we have become a poor away from Uh somehow I would like to connect this that we have become a poor away from society, not only for the garbage, but somehow it
Um, just to give you my, just to share with everyone my initial um, findings about zero waste. No, dahil uh, medyo matagal na huna uh, me and my team has been doing uh, a lot of research and a lot of consultations. Uh, Marami na kami na kausap ng mga experto and. Uh, Primarily because of economics. Uh, these are very expensive. And uh, to implement expensive plans, uh, you have to minimize this. Of course, in the negotiation, I don't know, you know when you invest in a malakang pera, it's risky in business. And the source of the risk is really coming from the supply of big stuff. Saan mga gali? para sa plan. When I say big stuff, ito yung basura. Uh, our political cycle does not remit one stuff to big stuff. Uh, it just comes for um, that much. Alam naman natin na every three years nagkakaroon tayo ng election. The mayor cannot sign up a contract longer than his term. Uh, it's already a, uh, a settled ano magpapatay ng planta na ang supply mo ng feedstock up to three years lang no it's it's no one's gonna do that no dahil uh, very risky in business at the same time paano kung natalo yung kausap mo din wala ka ng feedstock what, what if the next chief executive will say and then magsanitary landfill nilang tayo then you know then the investment um, will not make sense um, so in our initial finding, the economics doesn't permit us to come up with a viable waste to energy project. No, not not now. So the question now begs: In ten years from now, na saan na tayo? Kasi alam ni Manhu natin, almost 100% of our waste 
is being thrown in a in 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 sanitary landfills and dump site. Marami tayong mga dump site mga yon. No, um, I think the the most evident is Boracay. No, uh, kalit-lit na island, 1,400 hectares. Meron silang dump site doon. So, um, I would I would still estimate probably around probably around 80% of our household waste tinatapon po sa dump site. And dump site, as we all know, is already illegal. No? Um, the sanitary landfills are also um, are mandated right now, pero with a population growing almost 3 to 4% per annum, uh, ngayon nasa 100 million na uh, ang population natin, about 22 million families. Um, at one point in time, um, sustainable pa ba yung landfill for our country because like I said now we're all throwing our garbage in the landfill so we're finding finding for ways to um, not only address the issue of garbage or issue of solid waste but we also have this issue of uh, energy security uh, marami siguro nagtatanong sa inyo bakit yung yung uh, presyo ng kuryente natin ay mataas this is because half of our power comes from abroad. No? Um, you might not like to hear this, but it comes from coal. No? Half of our generation uh, output comes from coal. And uh, imported itong lahat na coal na ito. So whenever there are uh, political uh, disturbances abroad, rest assured, our prices of crude and the prices of electricity will also go up. So in the long run, uh, what we want is to achieve some form of energy security um, through renewables, maybe through uh, maximizing our hydropower plants. And one of which that we are honestly looking at is the possibility of waste to energy. You know? Again, I'm, I'm studying. You know? I, I'm not saying that uh, this will happen tomorrow or next week. Um, that's why the science is also quite important behind this. The economics and the legalities can be solved through legislation. No? But the science is another thing. No? It's another complication. Um, the presentation of Doc um, Jorge earlier was really enlightening no? because um, tama si Doc, eh, no? when you talk to the proponents of, uh, especially the commercial proponents, ibang story ay yung maririnig mo. Eh, no? So, uh, but part of our job, no, kami ni, ni uh, Congressman Charlie, uh, part of our job is to listen and to come up with a fair, uh, fair recommendation. No? Uh, at the end of the day, what we want, at least in, in, uh, in our part, is what we want is um, what is the best for our country and the Filipino people. No? And we have to um, weigh the... Uh, pros and cons and also the consequences of those decisions so um, you know, thank you for um, inviting me and um, uh, coming out coming out with this forum it's really quite enlightening especially hearing from from uh, the science look okay, dr. Hore, the science behind waste to energy um, hopefully we will have more of this we will probably invite uh, some of you know to our hearings in the committee on energy um, just to get a balanced view of uh, uh, this technology. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. Salamat po, Senator Gatchalian. Both uh, the Senator and uh, Congressman Charlie, uh, I've known them way back when I was in PLCPD uh, in the uh, in Congress. Kaya, welcome po tayo sa another uh, issue or another policy debate. Uh, and uh, Kong Charles, you're, you're the only representative from Congress that is here. Would you want to uh, make your input now or your comments or would you want to listen first sa mga tanungan po at comment din buhat sa iba pa natin mga uh, narito sa... Okay. <laughs> Alright. So, uh, let's move around. Uh, can I see the hands that uh, would want to raise questions or comments? One, two, three, four... Okay, I'll, I'll call it in that five. Okay. Uh, Kong Charlie, dulo ka, sabi mo, ha? Okay. Uh, sir, dito po tayo magsimula, and then uh, I'll go over para pakaliwa. Pa pakilala niyo na rin po ang inyong mga sarili at uh, kung ano po sektor ang kinakatawan ninyo at kung ano po yung, o sino yung gusto niyong 
tapunan ng inyong tanong or comment. Salamat. My name is Edmond Dimalanta. I'm one of the Board of Trustees of Mother Earth Foundation together with Sonia. Um, yes, it was very enlightening, this whole forum. I agree with um, Senator Gatchalian. Sister, yung mga ginawa niyo sa Mindanao na, na pwedeng mangyari sa mga LGU, yung ginawa sa San Fernando. I've been to San Fernando with, with Sonia. Um, I guess the question is, dumadaming tao sa Pilipinas, dumadami ang basura, kahit gusto natin ng uh, luminis yung ating bansa, tubig, hangin, paano natin mag magagawang, anong magiging solusyon natin if um, Senator Rocha lang mentioned, tigil lang ang tone ng isang, ng isang uh, public servant, um, public uh, official, how do we do how do we, how can we do uh, or how can we accomplish a long term solution because this is all our concern and the concern of our children's children's children um, of course ang stand ng Mother Earth Foundation Zero Waste ngunit um, hindi natin kaya ang tulungan ng buong Pilipinas eh. uh, fund for for education and and for making uh, making a point and teaching people is is, uh, is a challenge. Siguro na siya may question na parang education na pa ang kailangan, you know? I, I but yes, zero waste. We support it. Um, we want that our next generation sa bansa kapo natin sa talampakan na magbebenefit nito. Hindi na tayo yan. Senator Gatchana, hindi na tayo buwan. Pero uh, maybe the question is what uh, what can we do kaya from the education uh, sector or education side? I think it, it, it's a question that is meant for everyone in the room, no? Uh, especially, of course, our panelists here. But uh, si Kong Charlie, hindi mamapaka din, nagtataasa ng kamay eh. Uh, may mikropono po ba dyan? Hindi kailangan. Ah, po. Hindi nga, hindi nga. Um, magkakilala kami ni, ni Congressman Chidey, brother of Dr. Francis. Charlie, naabutan po yata ka ng mikropon na dyan. It allows us ways and means to uh, tailor make or tailor fit uh, solutions to our individual communities no matter how big or no matter how small. If we will limit ourselves, no, we can only use this or we, can, we should only adopt uh, this type of uh, waste management then it might not be a good fit for everybody. As you yourself uh, just pointed out, the educational component alone to try to teach, share, or explain, uh, for example, the system of uh, Sister uh, Arce in their hospital uh, would take a lot of time and also a lot of uh, capital and effort, no? And then you have to question, will it be adopted by that new proponent in its total form or will there be another modification that might also change the output or success of, of that uh, endeavor? 
So, why is uh, waste to energy important? Uh, it's important because in the circular economy, you have the extraction of the raw materials from the ground that uh, are transformed into products. And then we, as citizens of the world, we consume these products. And when you have consumption, you have waste. There's no way about it. It's either organic waste or inorganic waste. And then, uh, you dispose of it. Now, the trend is to reuse. Before, it used to stop at recycling. So now, there's reuse, recycling, and then... Uh, what, what cannot be recycled or what nobody wants to recycle, that's what ends up in the waste to energy plant. The waste to energy plant lengthens the lifespan of all the sanitary landfills. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Mr. Kolaiko's company is one of the few or maybe the only one that has an operating sanitary landfill that complies with RA 903. So we are dumping our waste in places like, for example, I'll use Payatas. That's already closed. But people are dumping there every day, 24 hours a day, as far as Cavite and parts of Laguna because there's no other place to dump it. Now, if we're going to close our mind and say, Nde, tutul kami dito eh. we, won't, we don't even want to hear it. Tutul kami dyan. And we adopt what has been talked about here today, only here, in this forum. What about the time element that it will take us to teach all these systems. Let's quantify also that garbage that's going to end up where it's not supposed to be. And how do we clean that up later? So, uh, basically, I'm just saying uh, we should have an open mind. Zero waste is a good target. I believe in aiming high. So, even if you don't hit your target, you're still high enough rather than just do nothing and throw it all over. Thank you very much. Salamat uh, po, Kong Charlie. And uh, at some point, perhaps you could tell us ano naman po ang sitwasyon do sa TWG pa house na nagtatalakay po nitong uh, panukala na ito. Mon. Tapos na yung panukala sa house. At meron, uh, buo na po. Uh, as a making report lang po, para alam lang ng lahat. Uh, oh, shortcut na lang. Oh, shortcut na lang po. Uh, the amendments to RA 903 that will uh, allow the introduction of uh, waste to energy technologies has already been passed on third reading. So I think it has already been transmitted to the Senate. But uh, as of today, there is no counterpart sponsor in the Senate. Okay. Okay. So I, I'll reiterate my ending to my answer, and also part of Senator Wynn's uh, input kanina. Every three years we have an election. I appeal to you, uh, the N NGOs here. Don't naman terrorize our senators before election. Uh, allow them to, to, <laughs> have, uh, to have an opportunity to exercise their pragmatism. Yeah. Uh, Kung Charlie, ito po yung pinakadahilan. Kaya may importante yung ganito mga forum. Yes. Para nagkakapaliwanagan. And then we will enlighten voters that will tell us kung sino po yung mga karapat dapat kada tatlong taon na election. Um, ipaikutin ko lang po yung tanong na una sa iba pa pong mga panelists natin. Uh, can we uh, bond and then uh, kay Senator? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Ed. And uh, uh, in 
I just uh, beg to disagree with uh, uh, Kong Charlie, uh, with your indulgence, uh, Congressman. Uh, ang question kasi ano na pwedeng gawin, eh, di ba? I think uh, the city of San Fernando and many other places, uh, whether that's a rich community, urban poor community, have proven that uh, they can do it. Uh, ano yung cost? 150,000 to establish an NR MRF in one barangay. Compare that to the thousands or actually billions of pesos that cities and municipalities spend today for so-called waste management. Quezon City spends 1.2 billion pesos a year. On what? Payatas? Is that a solution? Pero itong, ito, uh, ginagawa na pwede nang gawin. In fact, uh, we, we should ask uh, uh, Council, the good councillor, gano uh, katagal ba bago na implement ito? I think less than three years, less than two years, gumagana na. Eh, magpatayo ka ng incinerator, magpatayo ka ng landfill, it will take you, what, three years, five years, and then at the same time, you have not even factored in the economic cost, you have not factored in the environmental and the public health hazards, uh, yung sinasabing hidden cost ni Dr. Emmanuel kanina. And we would maintain that if, if, if it's the Clean Air Act, uh, opening the doorway or the floodgates to waste to energy and uh, variants of incineration really uh, goes against the spirit and intent of the Clean Air Act, and that is why we oppose this. Uh, at the same time, we, uh, it's not a matter of coexisting eh, because uh, incineration uh, really takes away from the concept of zero waste. The EU, for example, does not include incineration or waste to energy otherwise known as recovery, as part of its definition of circular economy. So, the concept of circular economy is really about redesigning waste out of systems, out of products. And we do, we justify the continued production of problematic materials, materials that cannot be composted, materials that cannot be recycled, materials that cannot be reused. Uh, you justify the continued generation of these materials by burning them, or by incinerating or converting them, so-called into into energy. So, uh, Congressman, we beg to disagree. Uh, incineration waste energy is not part of a circular economy. Okay, Senator. Tapos, we'll go over to sa mga sa pagsumatanong. Yeah. Dagdagan ko lang sinabi ni Kong Charlie, no? I, I do agree with Kong Charlie, but dagdagan ko in another perspective, no? Um, to achieve yung zero waste, no? At the household level, you need to change human behavior. That's number one. No, that, that it's very basic. Kung hindi mo papalitan yung behavior ng tao, o hindi natin ma-achieve yan, zero waste na yan. Um, and to uh, change human behavior, you have to do two things, no? Or at least government has to do two things. One is to incentivize. Number two is to penalize. And I think in the model of San Fernando, is they're incentivizing. Uh, nagbibigay sila ng uh, tulong sa barangay and uh, the barangay uh, is incentivized to uh, segregate and to do uh, MRF. But incentivizing is a form of subsidy. No? And the subsidy is taken out of government revenues. So again, it's a question of economics. No? Uh, Gano ba kalaki ang subsidy na dapat ibigyan ng gobyerno para ma-achieve natin itong gusto natin ma-achieve na zero waste? Um, in my experience, I was a mayor for nine years. Um, it's really, really difficult and expensive to change human behavior. <coughs> and it's very too difficult to scale it up. That's why I agree with Charlie. The time element is also very important. We have, you, you can probably do it in a small situ. But for a city with almost 700,000 in population, highly urbanized, it, it, it's, it will take time. No? It will take time. And you have to apply a different mode of, of, of incentivizing or a different mode of um, uh, encouraging people of doing zero waste. Um, the other one is penalizing. No? Um, government will penalize those people who will not segregate at source. So, kung masasabi ni Pangulong Duterte na pag hindi ka na-segregate, itotokhang ka, <laughs> baka pwede yun. No? Uh, baka pwede yun. No? So, um, but again, no, uh, there's, a, there's a time element to both. Uh, human, human behavior will not change overnight. There's a cost to that. 
there's a time element, and the time element will cost you money also. No? So you have to run the economics of all of this. Eh? No? That's why, um, and I, I mentioned this earlier to Comsec. Uh, one of the one of the directions why we are doing this intensive consultation with various stakeholders in the waste to energy technology is because to untangle the supply chain of waste to energy. Kanina na mentioned ko yung political cycle natin so every three years. One of our proposals is to honor contracts that will last for more than three years. No? Um, so that uh, the contracts will not be hinged on the political cycle of the country. No? Another issue here is pag nangongolekta ko ngayon ng basura, bawat bayan na niya dinadaanan, merong iba ibang nga tawag, may tipping fee, may entrance fee, merong pathway fee no? that adds cost to uh, to the service. One of the proposals that we have is to remove those type of costs because those costs will burden no? the, the taxpayer at the end. So those are the things that we want to solve um, through legislation. But again, no, bottom line here is we have to change human behavior. Uh, sabi nga ho kanina yung education, but uh, education also has a cost. No? And education also has a time element. So um, that's why government needs to weigh this, this uh, incentivizing and also penalizing which one will work the best to achieve our goal. No? Uh, na po kami dyan, pero may, ko lang pong yung comment ni Contel, Thank you, Sir Ramon. A short uh, response lang po dun sa question. No? Like for the case of San Fernando, uh, as mentioned by Senator Wynn, uh, we have term limits po talaga. No? And this practice, uh, uh, we, we practice this uh, in the city of San Fernando for I think two terms now. So now, we're talking about the end term where kung makapag-re-elect pa ho no, ang ating mayor at kami ho. Uh, at, at this time, uh, on, a, on legislation level po doon sa amin, we were trying to institut institutionalize yung program so that after the term of our good mayor and our term, they would continue uh, practicing it po. No? Uh, I think uh, doon ho sa short term na nandito kami sa, sa, sa council as legislators like Kong and Senator, I, I have entertained siguro not less than 30 proponents regarding waste to energy. May Japanese, may Singaporean, may Australian, may UK. And marami ho uh, of them are really uh, very aggressive no in terms of presenting uh doon naman sa aspetong yon uh we really sit down with them and listen no alam niyo kung pakikinggan natin sila lahat maganda yung kanilang proposals no however uh ang question lang is we we know for a fact that the lifespan of a landfill is uh hindi naman talaga po pang matagalan and if we don't to practice the RA9003, we will shorten it further. No? As, as mentioned by Congressman uh, kanina, na ang payata so, close na, pero tinatapunan pa. Ibig sabihin, wala na ho siya doon sa capacity niya. No? Same with Metro Clark. Uh, siya ho ang uh, compliant sa 9003. Doon ho kami nag-re-render uh, ng service for the tipping fee, no? for the, the howling and the landfill. Pero alam ho namin at alam nila na mapupuno at mapupuno si landfill. Kaya nga ho, yung legislation sa ginagawa natin sa city, no? uh, on our own small way, straw or plastic regulations, no? to further minimize ho yung ating, uh, at alisin natin yung kultura na throwaway uh, mentality. No? So, sana ho, uh, mahanapan ma namin ang solusyon kung paano ma-institutionalize yung mga ganitong uh, uh, programs parang sigala may continuity you know? at uh, yun hong uh, uh, possibilities of a uh, technology nakikinig naman tayo ang, ang question ko lang ho 
sa lahat ng mga nag, nagpumunta sa amin doon for a waste to energy uh, facility, yung ash, yung ash na natitira kung saan pupunta. Kasi at the end of the day, baka mas malaking problema ho kung saan natin dadalhin. Ano? Uh, totoo ho na mamiminimize natin or we can uh, sustain yung ano yung uh, uh, waste to energy. Pero yung waste na dust ang malaking question mark ho doon sa amin uh, pag-aaral. Uh, ano? So, thank you. Salamat po. Uh, sir, uh, pakilala po kayo at kanyo pong uh, katanungan. Ako po ay si Rufo Colaico, uh, presidente ng Metro Clark. Customer po namin ng San Fernando. At um, bago lahat, gusto kong sabihin na dapat ma-recognize talaga na ang San Fernando City ay gumawa ng malaking hakbang. Hindi naman sa namimintas ako sa mga nakaraan na administration sa San Fernando pero alam naman natin na ibang-iba yung naging practice nung bago sa inyo. No? In fact, parang kiniklin up yata namin yung naipon nung bago, bago kayo nakarating. Eh, no? Pero before, or after having said that, let me really begin by saying Metro Clark Waste Management Corporation fully believes and supports that zero waste is the way to go. Ngayon, dalawang bagay yan. Na, ito bang zero waste ay literally zero waste. Maski pa paano may magkaka-residual yan. Kung hindi ako nagkakamali, nung nakausap ko si Senator Villar dun sa European Chamber Forum, ang estimate niya mga 20% yata. Ba, eh, talaga malaking bagay yan. Ngayon, at the same time, eh, nauulit-ulit na sabihin ng iba rito, si Senator at si Cong Congressman, eh, kumbaga, ang kailangan mangyari para mabuo yung layunin na yan ay lifestyle change. At kailangan talaga matutunan yun. Kumbaga, hindi na iba yun, sister, dun sa mga tinuturuan nyo na pasyente. Lifestyle change. Bawas ng kain ng asukal. Bawas ng kain ng taba. No? At exercise. O ngayon, alam naman natin, ang hirap gawin yan. O baka naman hindi kasing hirap yan gawin itong lifestyle change na babawasan natin ang paggamit ng plastic. Kasama dyan yung ano, eh, regulation. Halimbawa, yung mga SM na yan, kailangan silang medyo idiin na, uh, teka muna, yung, yung mga tindahan nyo dyan, no? uh, kasama lahat yan. Pero, hindi siguro mabubuo yan within a year. Yung behavior change na yan. Mabuti sa San Fernando, malaki na ang nagawa nilang change. Pero maski dyan, marami pa rin kayong residual. No? In fact, itong isang point ko eh, yung materials recovery facility, magaling yan. Pero in that very activity, you are exposing the workers to infection from the stuff in that, yung garbage na hinahandle nila, marami rin mikrobiot kung ano-ano sakit ang makukuha nila yan. In our case, we are probably the only landfill that absolutely prohibits scavengers. Nung una, nung madilim kami paggabi, naku, yung mga bata doon sa barangay na malapit sa amin, eh, mahirap ang buhay eh. nag scavenge sila roon. Hindi, dinadakip namin yung mga yun, ibinabalik namin sa magulang. Ano ang sabi sa amin? Ano ang pakakain namin dyan? Ganun talaga, mahirap ang buhay. Pero, hindi pa rin namin pinayagan dahil kakadulot ng sakit at kung ano-ano sa kanila yun. Eh, no? Ngayon, uh, eto nga yun, yun. Ang sinasabi namin, ang landfill ay ang interim solution habang, nakpap, habang papunta tayo sa zero waste. Sabihin na nating 10 years. Baka mas matagal pa. Dahil unti-unti yan eh. 
hindi naman isang biglang mangyayari after 10 years. During the, those 10 years, mababawasan ng mababawasan yung kalangan itapon sa landfill. So, ganun. Payag kami doon. Lilit ng lilit yung darating sa amin. Although sa totoo lang, hindi ganun yun. Today, we service 90 municipalities and cities in central Luzon. Even a little bit farther, ang Baguio, on and off, nagtatapon sa amin. Uh, nung minsan, natukso silang gumawa ng sariling landfill sa Baguio ba naman? E nung umulan ng umulan, gumuho, natabunan yung mga nasa ibaba. E mahirap talaga gumawa ng landfill sa bundok. No? So, ayun, nabalik sila sa amin. No? Uh, kabanatuan, uh, hanggang palayan, linggayin. Tumatanggap kami ng basura dyan. At para mabawasan ng gastos nila, ito yun, simple. Yung kumokollect ng truck, pinakamalaki na dyan, yung 10-wheeler. Para may economies of scale nga naman. Dahil 5 tons ang laman yan, kung maliit na truck, baka 2 ton na dadalang. E yung sunog ng diesel o gasolina, malaki. Ang ginagawa namin, sinasakay namin yung basura nila sa 40-foot trailer, 25 tons. E yung diesel naman na humahatak ng trailer namin, hindi nag-iiba rin sa diesel ng 10-wheeler na 5 tons. Eh. So, doon na, na lang nakakatipid na sila. No? Kaya, in a way, pag naging customer na namin yung mga yan at nakita nilang hindi na dum masyadong madumi yung paligid nila, nagiging sanay na sila, habit na eh. Kaya yung senator, yung totoo yung sabi mo, alam ko may mga lak may malaking-malaking proposal, dalawa na ngayon yun. Hindi matuloy kasi syempre yung funding institutions, naghahanap ng security of feedstock. Pero experience namin, from one day to the next, an LGU will stop being your customer, but you'll get another one, and then that other guy will come back. So, may security na rin eh. Kaya kami, handa na kami for the past two years. Pati yung detailed engineering nung magiging power plant namin, buo na. Hindi lang kami makakuha ng power purchase agreement. Hindi dahil doon sa financing. Kundi may mga regulation eh. Uh, nung naging murang-mura ang coal, yung dating 6 pesos per kilowatt sa coal-fired, naging 4 so, biglang, oops, hindi namin kaya yung four. Hanggang five kaya namin. So, yan ang mga, yan ang mga problema. Ito naman, ang sasabihin ko, totoong, ano, so, hindi mawawala yung dioxin. Although, our plant is designed to meet much stricter restrictions on pollution than what apply to the coal-fired plants. No? But look at this also. Gen Metro Manila generates 10,000 tons a day. Sa napupunta yan. About 60-70% sa mga bulubundukan sa Montalban at San Mateo. May konting na itatapon din sa dagat. Ngayon, nadiskubrihan, dun din sa Laguna Lake pala, may nagtatapon dun. Now, if we were to burn all of that, we would generate at most 300 megawatts. Metro Manila generally, on an average, consumes what? 7,000, 8,000 megawatts. And that's growing. You're looking at 4% of the electricity that's generated from waste to energy plants. No? Uh, and in fact, I, I think Congressman already in pointed out <coughs> The, we are not really looking at garbage fueled power plants as a source of renewable energy. The main point is to reduce the mass of the garbage that will have to end up in a landfill. In our case, it will be, as pointed out, ash. Now, is that ash, does that contain toxic material? Possibly, we haven't gone that far.
But our our uh, landfill is a truly engineered landfill. We have just completed a five hectare expansion. That includes a multi-layer construction. We build a flat, like a, like a baking pan, except it's five hectares. And it is graded, and then it's multi-layered. We start with clay, sand, gravel, and then finally some fabric to, to protect the thick layer of plastic that we put on top. Now, you cannot imagine that there is such a thing as a five hectare seamless piece of plastic. So what do we roll, we, we unroll large rolls of plastic side by side. Pero kung ganun lang yun, pag didikitin mo, lulusot naman yung, yung leachate doon, yung sabaw na nagpapulyot ng groundwater. Uh, Perkulaiko, yeah. uh, patawarin niyo po ako ha. Oh. Wala po tayong masyadong oras kasi na eh. Oh, sige, patatapos uh, na lang. Opo, may, mayro pa pong dalawa o tatlo pa yata gusto po magtanong. Opo, opo, iklian ko na. Oh. Sige po. Kaya yun, we need welding namin yun. We now have a five hectare seamless piece of plastic. You, we can dump ash there without risk of anything going down to the groundwater. Yun lang yun. So, to summarize, we do not propose waste to energy as a major source of electricity. Number two, we have no problem obtaining long-term funding from our uh, lenders and our foreign equity partners are prepared to put in the money. Number three, really in the end, landfills and possibly waste to energy plants are the interim solution while we are reaching that nirvana of 20% waste, not zero. Thank you. Uh, salamat po. Al alam ko pong may mga reactions na from our uh, experts here. Pero kunin ko na rin po muna yung mga katanungan ng dalawa pa na nasa likod. Uh, Ma'am, sige po. Tapos kayo. Nandiyan po yung mikropono. Ay, good morning. Um, Aileen Lucero, Ecoways Coalition. From the 1999 waste incineration term, it has been rebranded waste to energy na. So, ang ganda pakinggan, di ba? So, my question is to Dr. Emanuel. Um, sir, since ito ay waste to energy, totoo ba na nakakapag-create ng enerhiya ang waste? At kung ito ay totoo, gano ka ka? Gano kaliit lang? Kasi narinig ko itong enerhiya ay pinangako na rin nung nagtayo ng methane capture sa payatas. Pero hindi nangyari yung pagpapaplan siya sa loob ng isang linggo. So ngayon tinatanong ko, ito bang malalakihan na waste to energy uh, facility o teknolohiya ay makakapag-produce ng enerhiya nang hindi ka nag nang na, na, na sinasabi dun sa ano ha, sinasabi dun sa pinasa ng house ay meron pa ring recycling at meron pa ring segregation pero makakapag-produce ng enerhiya. Okay. Uh, yung pong dalawang dulong tanong uh, para po isang ano na lang uh, patada mamaya ng ating mga panelists. Sige, sige po, sir. I'm Dr. Balesteros, uh, June Balesteros from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and I teach uh, hazardous waste management in the graduate level. Um, I just have some comments, uh, not, not questions. Well, uh, Dr. Emanuel, uh, we have so many common things. You know. Like you, I was also educated in the United States. Uh, I went to school at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, which is a uh, top school in the U.S. It's at, at par with Stanford and MIT. And like you also, I, I worked with the UN, UNDP, and the UNIDO on the area of POPs management. So my comments is, I have several comments. So one is the uh, role of temperature in incineration. As you know, uh, dioxins and furans are generated by when there is incomplete combustion, when the temperature is quite low. I can cite the dozen of uh, 
academic uh, articles in, in the journals that says that at, eight, at least at 800 degrees centigrade, you don't generate dioxins and furans. So if your operating temperature in incineration is at least 850, uh, where modern incinerations now operate at 850 to 1100 degrees centigrade, you cannot, you will not generate all these uh, dioxins and furans. In fact, for example, all the 85 municipal waste incinerators of France, they are below the standards set by the EU, which is 0.1 TEQ per normal cubic meters. The same is true with Japan that incinerates at least 60% of its total solid waste generation. China, for example, has been doubling its investments on incineration for the past, since 2011, up to now. The uh, second uh, comment that I have is uh, the capability of the Philippines to monitor, uh, monitor uh, these dioxins and furans. Uh, if there's somebody here from BMB now uh, can, can corroborate my, with my statement that we already have the infrastructure to, to uh, to detect these dioxins and furans. In fact, uh, the regional uh, uh, laboratories of the EMB have been trained. They were sent overseas to uh, train in the uh, determination of, uh, I mean, uh, testing of dioxin and furans in emissions. And then the third thing, the last thing I would like to say is that in the uh, 17, um, uh, uh, called this development goals, uh, of the, United, of the United Nations, one of which is the Global Waste Outlook for Management. It states there that WTE, or waste, waste to Energy, would support the circular economy. So it does not uh, negate or remove waste to energy. It will support all of this uh, circular economy. And it still said also there that waste to energy is considered an ultimate disposal, and at the same time, harnessing energy from uh, the uh, from in the process and uh, we're talking here about economics and we have to consider also that uh, after the closure of the landfill you need 30 30 to 50 years monitoring and that's very expensive that w that's why we really have to reduce the uh, amount going to landfills and in the world bank study for example it says that in 20 uh, it's it indicated that uh, there's an increase uh, in, by 2025 of 165 percent in the waste generation based on 200, 2015 rate. That's all, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Prof. Malik Teros, and thank you for uh, sharing your own thoughts. Um, I think there's one more uh, at the back. Meron pa po bang gusto magtanong? Kundi. In a form of uh, uh, summarizing the whole discussion, I will now give back the microphone to uh, each of our panelists as a way of commenting to those na nag-provide po na rin ang sarili nilang views, as well as recommending a uh, set of actions uh, from here on. Particularly nga, uh, as uh, Senator had said, they're about to assess the proposal coming from uh, Congress on the uh, introduction of the uh, uh, amendment to the uh, uh, no, no, no to the incineration bill, bill and introduction of the uh, WTE. So uh, I think I'll, I'll start uh, with the sister Arce. You can use your, your microphone. Thank you, Mr. No, uh, in the course of the, uh, as we move the mic, pakisagot na rin po yung mga pertinent uh, questions. At marami po na kay uh, Professor Jorge. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have discussed really uh, extensively about this waste to energy. I personally, I believe that I think it's just a matter of determination and again, political will as what the LGU and San Fernando has uh, initiated now. Na, yung sinasabi na nga ang problema yung tao because they are the ones generating the waste but we are also the solutions. That if we really work together to have a shared mission to really take care of our uh, creation, of our nature, of the environment, then the, the 
waste somehow could be eliminated, not really eliminated, but really reduced significantly. Because uh, again, lifestyle, na nga, it, it would really take time. No? And uh, personally, I have, I have experienced that. Na titinan mo doon, puntahan mo, and really personally somehow supervise and personally really show how, how to do it. Uh, in a determination lang talaga siguro and uh, of course the leadership would, would really count. I, I really appreciate the initiative of um, again San Fernando that when they try to to incentivize and uh, but maybe uh, I, I don't think it would really continue all the way to really incentivize because some of the people they would know how to to make use of to to yung sinasabing may para sa basura so siguro on their own they will be able to to really uh, make use and to to revise things like in the composting i know that in some municipalities they also have so sinasabing common composting area wherein they they are able to to plant uh, vegetables or whatever some I know that some time ago there was that uh, um, sunflower farm na they were able to generate yung sunflower oil, parang ganun. And uh, at one time in the in one Sunday documentary, I have uh, I have seen the experience of Palumpon Leite, uh, Mayor Onyate. No? Uh, they were affected by the typhoon Yolanda and uh, they were really devastated. But the, somehow the, the mayor uh, initiated also to have that area uh, parang nakano sa peace sanctuary na kaban nila. Of course, at the first, uh, at first the people were reacting because that was also their source of income, the, the fish and the ano within the locality. But the mayor asked the the people, the community, that could you just give me time to to really prove that this uh, initiative should do well? And I think after two years, they are now able to generate more funds in the community. They have become a tourist spot and uh, I was very impressed that even for the tourists who would go to their island, they will already provide them with uh, waste containers so that the people, the tourists, would not leave any garbage in the area. Uh, I was so impressed and uh, all the more that if only, if we, will to, if we have the will to do it, probably we can really do it. It's just a matter again of uh, personal uh, conviction and leadership. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Senator, uh, any last word po? Uh, and then we proceed na rin po sa organizers nito mga forum na to. Or uh, answer to the question or any uh, recommendation for the future? Um, again, no, uh, what we're, ako kasi ang iniisip ko is, in 10 years from now, nasaan na tayo eh? No, um, do we think that... 2028. 2028, I think that is... Uh, we have to think ahead, no? We have to think... 10 years is actually quite short. But in, short. in terms of planning of garbage, disposal, waste disposal, and energy in particular, 10 years is a short time span, no? Uh, normally, this type of activities you plan ahead. But just to make it tangible, um, saan ba tayo? Nasaan ba tayo in 10 years? Meaning, uh, San Fernando lang ba ang magiging zero waste? Or are we looking at the entire Philippines mag zero waste? Um, at that time, our population probably will hit about 120 million. Um, saan ba tayo magtatapon ng, garb ng, ng basura at that time? So, um, we also look at the past, no? Um, with the with the um, approval of this law, Solid Waste Management Act, um, naging successful ba itong batas na ito sa gusto niyang dapat gawin, no? Kasi the heart and soul of that law also, part of the core um, direction of that law is the three R's, no? You reuse, recycle, and reduce. But have we achieved that, no? Um... So we have to look at also, analyze uh, kung ano ba yung nangyari. Because kung ano yung nangyari, most likely in 10 years yun din yung mangyayari. No? If we don't uh, uh, induce radical changes. But uh, we have to be realistic also. May mga bagay na, na mahirapan tayong palitan kaagad, like human behavior. 
no? Because human behavior, changing human behavior has caused, sabi nga ni Mr. Kolaiko, um, it's a lifestyle change. But changing your lifestyle also has cost, no? And, uh, and, and the time element also has cost. And can we afford to wait? No? And can we afford to come up uh, or put up, put up subsidies to change the behavior of our constituents? So I think, I think just to, just to uh, uh, leave everyone with some form of um, uh, question, siguro isipin ho natin na saan ba tayo 10 years from now? Dahil 10 years from now, kung saan natin gusto pumunta, dapat gawin na natin ngayon. No? And we have to, have to be realistic kung kaya natin abutin yung gusto natin puntahan looking at what happened in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, and uh, then, uh, yeah, uh, kayo na muna po, uh, Professor. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I made notes and I hope I don't miss, uh, I did miss any of the questions. But let me start with Dr. Ballesteros' point. Uh, first of all, the role of temperature. The bulk of dioxins that are formed, whether incineration or some of the newer incineration-based technologies, uh, are formed through de novo synthesis. In other words, it is not just for, uh, and let me give you an example of that. In the uh, BATLAB guidelines, we put as a requirement that incinerators, the primary chamber of these technologies should not go below 850 degrees for the reasons you mentioned. But that was, eno that was not enough. It was clear from other studies that if you do uh, operate at 850 and higher, you can reduce your dioxins, but you do not eliminate them because the bulk of dioxins are formed through de novo synthesis as the gas cools between the temperatures of 450 to 250 degrees centigrade. That's the reason why when I went to Japan, <coughs> I was very annoyed when I found out that the quench system they had put in was not really built to reduce dioxins because you can reduce dioxins further on the tail end where de novo synthesis takes place. So it's not um, completely true that by operating at 850, you do not produce dioxins. In fact, it's, it's, the science is quite clear. It's through de novo synthesis, through the cooling of the gases. Um, uh, you had mentioned a number of places, Japan, France. I looked, for example, at the, the latest uh, Hitachi, Hitachi Zosen plant in Paris. And uh, it's true that they can meet the dioxin standards of the EU, but if you compare them to the new uh, dioxin limits that the EPA is producing, they would not meet them. In other words, it depends on who defines what that limit is. And for those of us in public health who are pushing for even lower limits to protect public health, there will be many incinerators and waste, uh, waste to energy incinerators that would not uh, meet that. Um, on the capability of EMB, I submitted to EMB uh, three pages of questions since I'd been involved in dioxin uh, analysis in the past because uh, while it's true that uh, they have uh, gotten the instruments, they now have a high resolution GC mass spec, they did training in the US, as I mentioned in my presentation, it took the U.S. Uh, actually fully two decades, uh, two decades, till they were completely satisfied. And one of the key provisions, both in the U.S. and in Europe, is that to be able to maintain uh, the ability to accurately measure dioxins, they have to be part an, of an interlaboratory proficiency testing. In other words, on a regular basis, uh, there's an agreement in laboratories in the U.S., laboratories in Europe where uh, regulatory bodies or third-party bodies provide them with dioxin standards, they test them, and they see if they can actually do them. One of the things I requested from e EMBs to find out with whom are they doing their interlaboratory testing, I have not gotten any response yet. But uh, let's even uh, assume, and I hope, in fact, that they do have the capability, they're doing interlaboratory testing, they're doing all the QA, QC, uh, requirements and so on, it still doesn't address the issue of continuous dioxin testing. EMB does not now have any capability to do continuous monitoring of dioxins. As I pointed out in my presentation, many countries are going in that direction because we know that dioxin simply uh, is not produced at one constant amount. So doing one test a year or even two tests a year for between six to eight hours is not going to capture the episodic releases of dioxin. 
to protect public health, we need to do either continuous testing or very high frequency of sampling. And this is where I mentioned where our regulations have not caught up with the science. So, uh, so those are my main points. I, um, I uh, also wanted to uh, address the issue of um, uh, limitation of technologies. My big concern is that what I think should be the limitation is to understand how we, as the Clean Air Act uh, was based, how do we really protect public health? In fact, uh, Clean Air Act uh, moves a step further and talks about pollution prevention, which I want to address in a second. But uh, whatever technology it is, we must be able to monitor it, must be able to uh, enforce it, and we must ensure that public health and the environment are protected. And if we have no capability to do continuous dioxin sampling, if we don't even have laws to test uh, uh, the contaminants uh, in ash, then we cannot really claim to be able to protect our communities and our public health. So that leads me to the point about the issue of being an interim solution. Um, it's easy to think of WTE, and often they'd like to present it that way, as waste coming into their equipment, you get some electricity, and everything is nice, clean, and gone. But we have to remember that whenever you burn, you treat this waste, there'll be pollutants coming out in the ash, there'll be pollutants coming out into the air, and there'll be pollutants coming out in the wastewater if they use uh, things like wet scrubbers. And even our laws, unfortunately, do not, have not caught up with that. We have no limits, for example, on dioxins in the wastewater. We only require, if I recall, one, uh, one uh, test of uh, uh, sampling of dioxins in air once a year. And we don't have any regulations on dioxins and others in ash. Um, so there was a question of, uh, the other claim is that you can continue to do segregation and recycling and still, still produce energy. Uh, this was the other flaw that I pointed out in some of the waste to energy proposals. Because, for example, in one waste to energy plant uh, that's being proposed, the one for Davao, the Japanese have actually been doing uh, studies of the waste and looking at their caloric intake. Because the whole purpose of this is if you have a waste to energy plant, you want to use that aspect of the waste that you can burn and get the most energy from. And what is that primarily? It is plastic. So if you are supposedly segregating, recycling your plastic, minimizing the use of plastic, and so on, it goes against the grain of waste to energy because then you're not going to produce enough of the el electricity that they're going to claim. Uh, I want to end up more on the philosophical concept of a circular economy. If you look at all the components of the circular economy, it starts with extraction. And extraction has a cost. And I'm not just talking about the economic cost. I'm talking about the health uh, and environmental costs of extraction, uh, which often is not included in much of the cost accounting. Uh, and then there's a manufacturing cost. You extract either fossil fuel or whatever might be the raw materials coal and so on, uh, it goes through some manufacturing process which has its own set of waste, just as extraction has a huge amount of waste that, that's associated with it. So even in the manufacturing, you have costs, many of them not accounted for, and waste as well. Then you have the consumption. And then uh, I will introduce two concepts, one that I learned when I was, uh, my minor was in material science. And I remember my material science uh, professor uh, telling me, you know, in uh, material science, materials engineering, we can design materials to fail. Uh, he worked, my professor used to work in the uh, automotive industry. So he said, we can design metals to fail so that if you're building a car, some metal piece will break and we can design it so it will break, uh, say, a year after the warranty. And that's something we all know in science, we can do the same with plastic. We can, we can look at the degree of crazing. We can determine when things are going to break depending on the cyclic stresses and so on. And so one of the things that you should be aware of is that many in industry have applied the concept of planned obsolescence. 
how do we design materials so that after a certain period they break so that the consumer has to buy more of the same thing? Uh, the other concept I want to bring in on the issue of consumption is what I call manufactured demand. There are many things that have been marketed to us that we need desperately and we need to buy. A good example is the plastic straw. This comes from fossil fuels, so much energy goes to make the plastic straw. Uh, a lot of waste produced, it then gets transported, and then it's sold. We use it for about 10 minutes and we throw it away. And, uh, and so this is an example of manufactured demand. For millennia, people used to drink things without using a straw. But somehow our so societies have been uh, convinced that we desperately need the straw to drink our soft drinks or to drink our juice and then we throw it away. This is what the Pope referred to as the throwaway society. Um, and because uh, we're able to manufacture these things so cheaply now, and because of volume, they become cheap, we throw it away, they have to produce more. So in the circular economy, what we have been trying to do is those materials that we can reuse, recycle, compost, we maximize that as possible to make uh, a circular economy. The problem with throwing waste to energy into the concept of a, of a circular economy is that it doesn't cut back on what we consumers need to do. And this is the basic concept of zero waste. Zero waste is not just treating what happens to the waste after the fact, maximizing segregation, maximizing recycling. We need to go before the waste is done. This is the spirit of the Clean Air Act, pollution prevention. Therefore, the concept of how do we change our thinking, how do we create new lifestyle, then becomes very important. And therefore, something that, like waste to energy, which enables and continues to reinforce this concept of a throwaway culture, does not fit in a circular economy concept. Even though the waste to energy people have convinced some governments, some international agencies to include it, it should not. And so what we need to do is to do education. Uh, until a few years ago, when I moved back to the Philippines, I was living in San Francisco. San Francisco will be a zero-waste city by the year 2020. San Francisco's Department of Environment even had a special person whose main function was to work on education of the young people. In fact, we invited her to the Philippines, I think two years ago, I forget. And she explained the importance of her work, and I could see it in San Francisco. Uh, and also in Berkeley and in East, the East Bay, which are getting becoming zero-waste cities. Because it is the young kids who are then telling their parents, you shouldn't throw that in, in our trash. That's recyclable. And it's the young people who are saying, we don't need this straw. And it's the young people and this new generation that are going to have to begin to rethink their roles as consumers on how we need to educate people on what we buy, what we demand of the manufacturers to the to either reduce their packaging or to create products ca that can be fully recycled by using the right materials, the right design, and not follow on uh, and continue to enforce this wasteful society of uh, throwaway society. So what should we think of in the next 10 years? If San Fernando can do its work in three years, we, uh, it's a question of political will and where is our priority? Where is all the money going? If I, I am working right now where I live in Dumaguete to, to make Dumaguete a zero-waste city. It's been a big struggle be, for several reasons. One, I interviewed all 30 barangay captains. Many of them were not even dealing with their waste. They don't have any MRFs and so on. They're not compliant with 9003. We were able to get three barangay captains who said, yes, this is the way we want to go. We will join your project. And so we got, we decided to create models in three barangays. I said, okay, let's start with those three. Then we can convince the others. Then came the issue of money. Then all of a sudden the city says, well, there's no money here. So we had to go to international funders to get money for us to do a zero waste city project in, uh, in Dumaguete. Now, can you imagine if instead our political leaders decide we'll put more of our money to making zero waste cities? And if, if uh, San Fernando can do it in three years, we are, aiming to change the three barangays within a year. <coughs> Ask me again in a year's time if we succeeded or not, but th that's certainly our goal. And I think if more and more barangays and local government units are empowered, informed, 
and help through in moving towards zero, zero waste, I think as a country we will move there, there sooner and we can break sooner this whole deadly, s dangerous and polluting cycle that of a throwaway culture that we have established uh, in the world today, I must say. Listening to Senator, uh, sorry, <laughs> Tony should be a senator, uh, Prof. Jorge. But uh, we learn a lot uh, every time. Now, uh, I forgot the sequence now. Uh, BJ again, and then last, Naren uh, Vaughn. And then uh, we call on the uh, closing remark. Thank you, Sir Ramon. Uh, actually, it's, it will always be a continuous learning for everyone. Ako kami ho sa city of San Fernando, kahit ho palaging nababanggit ang ating LGU, it's not really a perfect system, no? Uh, in fact, after the barangay election, we have 35 barangay captains and 15 of those are newly elected. As of the moment, they're always calling the office uh, for, for help, for assistance. Pero hindi ho kami nagsasawa. No? Hindi ho kami nagsasawang uh, tumulong, mag-advise, mag-assist sa kanila. Dahil uh, yung momentum andun, ano? and alam namin na maraming gusto, no? dumarami ho ngayon ang uh, ang uh, gustong tumulong sa ganitong approach. And uh, they find it uh, our, our, our option as of the, this time. No? Sinasabi nga natin na uh, ang landfill is just an interim and we're talking about a bigger uh, bigger project. No? Well, coming from government side, I, I want to be a devil's advocate on, on, on that. No? Uh, hindi natin uh, like this forum, ito ho ay eh, talagang very healthy, no? Uh, as mentioned by our good congressman, it's already it already passed the third reading on the Congress and uh, papasok na sa Senate. Uh, actually, they just amended the, the the portion of the Clean Air Act yata to, to ano, yung provision, ano? But uh, while doing that, ano, uh, yung lahat ng process, and it's a 10-year process, uh, plan na sinasabi ni, ni, ni Senator na maiksing panahon lang, no? Uh, ten years is talaga mabilis po. Uh, siguro ho, uh, kunin natin yung pagkakataon na ito, no? Na zero waste approach is not really zero, no? Hindi ho zero. But we really need to minimize and be conscious, no? Uh, on our day-to-day -day, uh, uh, output, no? Like, like, example, for just today's uh, event, Meron ho tayong plastic doon sa tinapay. Meron tayong plastic bottles. No? Uh, alam niyo ho, uh, maliit na uh, bagay. No? Sa LGU po ng City of San Fernando, before, pag meron ho kami mga events, we use bottled water. But now we provided uh, yung mga ganito hong bottles. No? So every, every time meron ho okasyon ang city government, meron hong mga water dispensers around and you you get your own water no so yun ganong bagay no uh, like before we introduce the plastic regulation inobserve ho namin yung behavior sa palengke pag bumili ng limang items ang isang consumer lahat ng items limang plastic pero kung pag sasamahin ho yung limang items dun sa isang plastic it's more than enough yun ho ang ang, ang kulang ho namin ngayon dun sa implementation of plastic uh, banning sa San Fernando is yung market pa rin. No? Uh, gusto ko namin ngayon na maging conscious sila. Minsan, isang ballpen lang naka-plastic. Isang something naka-plastic. So, uh, ang tendency for convenience, bit-bit, pero pagdating sa bahay, disposal is the problem. Plastic is not uh, hindi ho masama ang plastic. But, pag ho dispose natin kung saan-saan, doon ho siya nagiging masama. So, anyway, uh, while the government is looking for a long-term solution or a permanent solution to this, I encourage everyone to to keep in mind the, the to practice ho yung to minimize. No, uh, after the MRF, we malaki ho ang natit na bawas namin doon sa daily uh, generated waste sa city of San Fernando. So sana uh, ma maintain ho namin no? uh, at uh, makatulong din sa mga ibang LGUs habang naghahanap ng solusyon ang ating national government. Again, uh, thank you and good morning po. Okay. 
Uh, we're a bit uh, beyond our time, uh, so uh, uh, Bon will be the last among the resource persons, and then I'll call on uh, Eileen to do the, to do the uh, closing remark. At saka doon sa pinakalabas po lang, paglabas, at tinatawagan po yung mga uh, panelists natin to join the photo op, nakabang po doon yung ating mga media photographers uh, to do some uh, shots. Okay, Bon. Thanks, Moon. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple of points. Uh, una una yung question na, kasi uh, obviously we need to come to a decision, right? And and what we say here is, uh, especially for policymaker, senator, uh, and good congressman, uh, the art of decision making is really choosing that right set of solutions that take you in the right direction, diba? And we believe that the direction is really towards zero waste. At, uh, uh, yun ang experience na nakita natin sa uh, mga sa San Fernando and globally in places like San Francisco and many other places in in Europe. Now, and always, and I remember at the height of the Cleaner Act debates uh, in 1998, mga 1998-1999, the main argument, one of the main arguments being propounded by proponents of incinerators was human behavior. Sabi na, tamad ang Pilipino, uh, hindi nila gagawin yan, they won't segregate their waste. Palaging yun ang ginagawang excuse. And I think, uh, I think uh, it should be fair, uh, especially on the part of our elected uh, legislators, to have more faith in the Filipino. Kasi as uh, what we have seen in many places, uh, if, the if there is a system that is well established, people will follow, right? In San Fernando and other places, kung walang plastic na... Uh, hindi ginagamit sa uh, even the public wet market, meron ng example sa, sa Negros, hindi gina, in, na appreciate pa nga ng tao pag nakita nilang merong sistema at consistently ginagawa ito. And this is I think the challenge for uh, uh, executive uh, local executives and also decision makers na uh, ano ba yung sistema na pwede nating gawin na talagang consistently ma-apply. Doon natin i-apply yung political will at yung tinatawag nating visionary leadership. Natural yung zero waste, merong residual waste dyan, di ba? Meron tayo, hindi naman lahat mare-recycle, hindi lahat mo-compost, hindi lahat mare-reuse. So, ang challenge natin sa inyo ngayon, eh, tignan nyo ano ba yung components ng residual waste? Ano-ano ba yung nakikita natin doon? Mga sachets, mga single-use plastics, and therefore, siguro ang policy orientation natin is find out how can we eliminate or how can we make the manufacturers of these problematic or unnecessary items accountable Diba? Through extended producer responsibility, for example. Why should we as taxpayers shoulder the burden of dealing with the disposing of these items? Na in the first place, dapat uh, ang requirements sa kanila, kung hindi yung kayang i-recyclo o hindi kayang i-compost, huwag niyong i-manufacture yan in the first place. And it is time right now to focus on the front and masyado tayong fixated sa back end eh. Disposal, disposal, disposal. In fact, that is one of the problems why we are where we are today. The Department of Environment and Natural Resources, the main, main agency which should be, you know, guiding the implementation of the law, has been busy uh, undermining both the Clean Air Act and the uh, RA9003 by promoting uh, incinerators all this time, despite what the law uh, uh, says and specifies. So uh, maybe it's time to get fixated on the right uh, framework on the front end. Thank you. Uh, before I call on the Aileen uh, uh, Seaton, uh, ang special pasalamat natin, again, uh, kay Senator Katsalian, salamat po for listening and staying true. Uh, we know na nalimit po yung inyong uh, pagsalita. Uh, pero dadalo po kami sa inyong uh, ita itatawag na mga public hearings Ganun din po kay uh, uh, Kong Charlie uh, Kuwangko na may sariling forum sa kabilang side. Nagpapasalamat po kami sa inyo na, na, po, na nakikinig po kayo ng mabuti at uh, your are so uh, concerned about this uh, issue. Uh, wala na rin po akong panahon para mag-synthesize kaya ililipat ko po yung uh, responsibilidad na yun uh, kay Ms. Eileen Season. Siya po ang aming presidente sa Ecoways Coalition at member in Rufusia ng Noburn, Pilipinas. Both were um, sponsors of this uh, forum together due to po sa opisina ni uh, Senator uh, Villar at saka yung pong ating uh, committee.
ng environment of Finado. Uh, uh, magandang tanghali po. Alam kong uh, uh, lunch na lunch na kayo. So, hindi po ako magpapakahaba. Gusto kong magpasalamat sa ating mga uh, participants sa araw na ito. Ganun din sa ating mga resource persons at sa kay Congressman uh, uh, Kohuanko at kay Senator Win. Uh, habang pinakikinggan ko po ang lahat, naisip ko na um, lahat naman tayo, uh, meron tayong convergence. Ang convergence natin doon sa ating layunin na uh, ma-prevent ang pollution, magkaroon ng balance sa ecology, magkaroon ng uh, uh, protection ng health ng ating mga kababayan. Lahat po tayo nagkakaisa doon. Uh, sa forum na ito, may divergence tayo pagdating sa pamamaraan. Ang sinabi po ng aming mga kasama, uh, baka naman pwedeng bigyan din natin ng diin ang front-end solution sa waste rather than doon sa uh, dulo ng end of the pipe. Uh, which would be more uh, effective? Should we do both uh, pareho at sabay in the next, sabi ni, uh, ano, ni Senator Win, 10 years? Ba anong mangyayari sa 10 years? Maybe if we uh, concentrate on both ends, we will see a beautiful country and we will not see a doomsday scenario. So, maraming salamat po sa ating lahat and we will continue to dialogue with you. No burn Pilipinas. Week. Thank you. Uh, Nag-aabang po yung ating mga photographers kung pwede pong mag-filabas yung ating mga tagapagsalita at kung pwede na pong imbitahin si Senator doon sa uh, photoshoot sa labas. Saka si Kongko Wangko, uh, kung gusto niyo po kaming samahan sa Photoshoot po tayo sa labas. Ahawakan niyo yung banner.